recycled and uh, I gave money to Greenpeace and Sierra Club and, and things like that. And uh, I generally thought things were getting better and better. And then in 1999, the World Trade Organization um, had a big meeting up in Seattle. There was a big protest. Um, and it turned into, um, turned into a, big, a big event because the police um, were violent. And um, it had the effect of, of putting what the WTO was doing uh, into the popular consciousness because um, the major news organizations reported on it and suddenly people became aware that um, corporations were, were um, really behind the effort of negotiating these trade deals that were in their favor and that were for the most part held in secret, they weren't accountable and that many aspects of these free trade deals um, were harmful to the environment, harmful to people in communities, and so on. So that woke me up, and um, it took me a couple of years to, to move from what I was doing into something that was more aligned with my values. But um, that was a big wake-up call for me, because I think um, it was it contained in that moment was really kind of everything because um, corporations gaining more power and eroding our democratic institutions is a big problem. But also, um, they're destroying uh, the kind of economic system we have, controlled by, by these big corporations, is, is literally destroying the biosphere. It's consuming the planet. And um, that may sound alarmist, but that's in fact what's happening. So that launched me on my journey, and I began to educate myself. Um, eventually, um, I stopped doing what I was doing, and I joined uh, some green and pro-social businesses and startups. I was, I was kind of a business person. And at first, I sort of cursed the fact that I hadn't done something else with my life, hadn't become an environmental scientist or you know something useful. Um, but my, my thinking about that has changed, so after uh, however many years, probably 10 years in California um, working for some green and kind of community scale startups and then starting um, something for a, big, uh, a bigger company, um, my education around uh, not just what the what people like to refer to as the neoliberal capitalist system. The problem is bigger than that. But the kind of economic system that we have, um, that became clear. And also the alternatives and, and the things that, um, that we need to protect at the local and regional level, but also the things that we could do differently at the local and regional level to begin to address those problems, to put more political and economic power back into the hands of real people. Um, to strengthen and make more resilient the economies at, uh, at local and regional levels, um, to make those local and regional economies uh, more inclusive, more unfair, more accountable, more ecologically sustainable. That was all, that was all before I moved here, and then since I've been here, I've been involved in the the Totnes for Economy project were a part of uh, Transition Town Totnes. So you crossed the US, you crossed the ocean, you came here just to uh, join the movement or before you... My partner's English. My partner's English. We met in San Francisco and uh, we decided to move to England to take care of her, her father who was 96 years old or something and we decided to move. And we decided to come to Devon or Cornwall because it's the most like California you can get and still be in England. It's not like California. But <laughs> and we came to Totnes because, um, you know, because I was already kind of doing this kind of work in California, you know, in a slightly different way, a slightly different frame. We, <coughs> we, heard, about, um, we heard about Totnes because of the transition town thing. And we thought, wow, transition town. 
the whole town? They're transitioning the whole town? That's cool. We should go check it out and maybe we should live there. So that's what brought us here. Transition Town Totnes um, and transition initiatives everywhere is, is really kind of about how can members of a community join together to do things to become more, um, more cohesive as a community, to reduce uh, the ecological footprint, uh, to uh, become more resilient, that kind of thing. And if you, you know, if you, uh, whatever your motivation is to get into this kind of work, it might be concern about the environment, it might be concern about um, uh, the, the disappearance of community connection and community life. It might, be, it might be a range of things, but in the end it all comes back to economics. So the reason we have these problems to begin with is because of the kind of economic system we have. So uh, what could we do locally in Totnes and in our region of uh, the southwest of England, what can we do to begin to create alternatives to that destructive corporate-led kind of economic system and to create something that is more inclusive and fair, ecologically sustainable or even better ecologically regenerative uh, and also become more resilient. So that's kind of a, that's kind of the starting question and so for us um, when we began about seven years ago, um, we started thinking about, well, all right, if we want to have a different kind of economic system, then maybe what we should do is try to support new enterprises of whatever kind, enterprises that would benefit the community, enterprises that would be part of the solution. And, um, you know, we had some, some ideas about starting an incubator. Um, we did another piece of work uh, doing some research into the local economy. We launched another project that we call the Local Entrepreneur Forum and we started just, you know, doing things. And I think in the beginning we didn't have, we didn't have a theory and um, we really just thought uh, we would do what we could do. After, after several years now, we, we do have a bit of a theory that helps to explain what we're doing um, as, as, a, as a theory of change, as a theory of development, as an approach to doing something. And we think that what we're doing, well, we know it works um, because we've gotten results, but we think it's something that is, is something almost anybody, almost anywhere could also do. So, Coming back to that question, if we want a new kind of economic system that will do all those things, be just and ecological and include people and uh, be resilient and be an alternative to, this, to the destructive kind of economics, well, we have to create the conditions for new economic actors, new models, new relationships. So how do we do that? Well, we have to catalyze a new kind of entrepreneurial culture. So it's not enough just to say, well, we need more entrepreneurs. Well, yeah, but we need entrepreneurs of a certain kind. We don't need more Mark Zuckerbergs or Elon Musks, um, although, you know, I suppose there's room for them too. But we, need but we need entrepreneurs in this day that, that uh, can create those alternatives. So we need entrepreneurs that are maybe one part activist, one part community organizer, one part permaculturalist, and you know, somebody who can make a thing financially self-sustaining. But if we're talking about that entrepreneurial culture, it's not only about the entrepreneur. There are, there are lots of roles to be played in that process of starting something up. So we're talking about an entrepreneurial culture, we're also talking about investors, so making local people aware that they could invest themselves in that process, whether it's investing social capital or financial capital. So one of the other things we really try to, to uh, do is 
find ways of getting people to make that investment and get involved. And then another big component is building out an ecosystem of um, projects and say uh, institutions that can support that process, that can support those new actors, those new models and so on. So things like um, financial platforms or co-working spaces, incubation spaces, that kind of thing. And then the fourth thing that we would include in this approach is building networks. So we can't do it alone, and we can't do it alone in our town. So we need to build relationships and networks with people who are, who are interested in doing this kind of thing too, across all, our whole region. So, um, you know, if we, if we think about all this in terms of new economics, there are many people who would identify themselves as being part of new economics, but oftentimes they don't talk to one another. So you've got people doing community energy over here, who don't talk to the people doing food sovereignty over there, who don't talk to the people who are doing housing over here, who don't talk to these people who are doing social entrepreneurship over there. So, so we want to get all these people connected up and becoming uh, acquainted and creating the conditions for mutual support and more ambitious collaboration. So this is kind of our approach. So uh, catalyzing a new kind of culture around problem solving, uh, entrepreneurship, mobilizing uh, social capital and financial capital that's already here, building out an ecosystem uh, to support those kinds of new uh, actors and so on, and then uh, building networks. So let me explain a little bit about the projects that we're doing. Um, as I said, we started doing projects and then we sort of theorized about what we were doing afterwards. Um, there's a really great quote from E.F. Schumacher. So, you know, the, the economist who wrote the book, Small is Beautiful, he said um, something like, an ounce of practice is worth about a pound of theory. So if you want to translate that to, to the metric system, um, a gram of practice is worth about a kilogram of theory. And so I think that helps to explain, you know, a little bit about how we came to understand what it was that we were doing and why it was working. So we first started doing stuff. First thing we wanted to do was an incubator, and we failed to get an incubator going. So we, we ran into this obstacle and that challenge, and um, it was very difficult. So we, we kind of said, well, if we can't do an incubator, let's do an incubator in one day. So that led to something we call the Local Entrepreneur Forum. And this project we've been doing for six years. This will be the seventh year. Um, we have run it most of the time as a one-day event. And the idea is that we invite everybody in the community who's a, an entrepreneur, potential entrepreneur, investor, potential investor, um, an expert, consultant, uh, an enabler, catalyst, influencer, everybody, really. <laughs> we generally get about 120 or 30 people into the Civic Hall. And, um, you know, we have a speaker or two. But the main part of the, the first half of the day is we do open space and we get people talking to one another. So open space is a way of doing uh, kind of a self-organized conference. So people say, I, you know, I'm interested in talking about ecotourism. Who else is interested in that? Or I would like to learn about how to talk to investors. Who wants to talk about that? And people self-organize around tables and talk about these kinds of things. Um, we have a, a needs and offers wall so people get to connect. Uh, that way, and really all of these interactions are a good, they're a good way of developing that entrepreneurial culture, by the way. So every place where you find a strong entrepreneurial culture, you find spaces where people can interact and exchange ideas and get to know one another. So whether it's an entrepreneur being able to meet an investor or a fellow team member or whatever. So this is really uh, an important part of that whole process. And then the second half of the day, we have four or five projects pitch to the investors. And this is where it's really kind of special and really kind of is something new. 
So we say that everybody has a stake in their local economy and everybody should be able to uh, you know, say what kind of businesses they want to have in their community. Really? So we make it really easy for everyone to play this role of investor. So uh, we might have a, a local farm pitching, you know, we want to start this local farm, we want 10,000 pounds to buy some equipment, and we want help with our business plan, and we want help with our website. Well then, everybody in the audience plays investor. We call it the community of dragons. And they'll say, well, I'll loan you 1,000 pounds, or I'll give you 100 pounds, or I'll help you with your business plan, or I'll help you with your marketing plan, or I'll help you with your website, or I'll be your customer, or I'll introduce you to somebody I know, or I'll give you 25 fruit trees, or I'll watch your kids while you go to a meeting, or I'll make you lunch, or I'll bake you a cake, or I'll just give you a hug because I think what you're doing is awesome. So everyone gets a chance to participate, and that sends a really strong signal out to the community that, hey, if you wanted to start something, people would be there to support you. So that makes it a possibility. So a French intellectual might say, it becomes now part of the imaginary. It becomes part of the possible. So uh, we've been doing this for six years. We've raised about um, 85,000 pounds directly from members of the community to support 27 different enterprises. So some of these are startups. Some of them are existing enterprises that are just uh, expanding. We have criteria, so they all have to be benefiting the community in some way. So are they ethical? Are they green? Are they social? Um, so that's worked pretty well. It's helped to create jobs and stuff like that. It's helped to also get people in the community involved because not only have they invested money, but also they've invested other things. So we, by our calculations, we've had non-financial investments worth probably 20,000 pounds. So small amounts of money and small amounts of effort, but um, it's gotten some things going that other not that otherwise wouldn't have gotten going. One of the benefits that we've seen is that many of these enterprises now collaborate with one another. So it's created a bit of a network in, in that regard. So not unlike Cooperativa Integral Catalana, where you have different, different cooperatives cooperating with one another to provide um, uh, products and services and so on. So that's, that's happening here as well. Um, and they're also creating alternatives to products and services that are made from outside the area. So um, increasing our local multipliers. So we're really proud of this project. It's kind of doing all of those things that I mentioned. So it's helping to create that culture, helping to mobilize the capital. Because we do it every year, it becomes part of the local ecosystem. So. That's one of the, the important projects that we do, and it's very easy to get involved. People now um, call us up and say, hey, I'm interested in pitching next year. I've got a project, what do you think? One of the other projects that we have is, in fact, an incubator, or at least uh, the Reconomy Center. So we, we started out by, with our project to try to start up an incubator, and it took us a while. So this is four years old. And uh, we got this as a result of building a relationship with the local council. And um, one of the ways that we built credibility for ourselves and built that relationship was through yet another project. So that other project we call the Local Economic Blueprint. We also started that about seven years ago. And the, and the idea behind that project was to research the local economy, look at the key sectors, identify the opportunities for more local ownership, more local production, um, and then put some kind of value on it so that we could have a conversation with people in the local government and other places to say, well, if we did more local production, that would be worth seven, eight, nine, twenty, a hundred million pounds in our local economy. So. When you talk in that language, now you can, you can bridge those ideological gaps. So you can talk to the conservative, you can talk to the, the left-wing socialist, and you can talk a similar language. 
If we started up businesses that would benefit the community, they would make this much money, that would be good for everybody, right? Yes. <laughs> so, so we did that research, we built a relationship with local council, which is run by the Conservative Party. And after we did that project, we said, you know, if we want to take advantage of these opportunities, we have to have some new local firms or some more uh, robust local firms in order to do that. Why don't you give us this office space that you're not using? We'll turn it into a co-working space and an incubation space. Don't charge us any rent. And they said, sure. <laughs> so, um, so we've been operating here for four years. We don't pay rent. We have other expenses. We run it on a pay-what-you-can model. So it's very flexible. It kind of blows people's minds at first. Um, but we say, you know, pay what you can pay. And uh, whatever it is that you can pay, the most important thing is to engage with other people who are working here and so that we can create a bit of a, a, a mutual uh, self-supporting kind of culture. And that's proven to be really, really beneficial too. So some of the people who've become members here and work here have gone on to pitch at the local entrepreneur forum and vice versa. We have about uh, 100 members of this place. It's very small. They're not here every day. Um, in fact, we have a core membership, people who, who use the place quite often, of about 40. So you talk to Ian Bright from Tresshawk, so they're members and they're in here every Tuesday. Um, and we have uh, many other individuals who are, who are working on their own business uh, working here. Uh, people who come and work in groups who are starting a new business or work for an existing company, that kind of thing. Yeah, so it's working pretty well, and all of these things work together now. And we've, uh, we've since looked around and said, well, what else can we begin to do to build out that ecosystem? So now we do another project that we call a hackathon, where we get people in the community who've got very, very early stage ideas to come and uh, present them, and we work on them in a kind of a workshop setting. Um, we also run lots and lots of workshops from the Reconomy Center oftentimes from members of the community in kind of a skill-sharing kind of way. Um, and we are, uh, we're part of, yeah. I'm talking and talking and talking. No, 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 it's all good. It's okay. great. Okay. Um, so one of, the, one of the other things we're looking at to kind of build out our ecosystem is um, a local investor network, so trying to work with individuals who, who um, have money to invest uh, to, try to, to try to organize that a little bit. But part of this idea of building out an ecosystem, too, is, is building relationships with other institutions in the region. So it's not just about us and our projects. We're also building relationships with Dartington uh, Hall, which is a big estate and social enterprise just on the edge of town. So they're landlords for many of the projects that we're involved with, um, farms and other things. Um, they run the School for Social Entrepreneurs out there, so we have a good relationship with them. They have the Schumacher College, which has an economics program, and we do a lot of things in collaboration with them. Um, we have links to Plymouth University. So that's also a very important part of the ecosystem. And we have links to the local authority, the local government. So that's been very useful also. Um, last thing I'll say is another project that we've been undertaking collaboratively with other people in our region is something we call the Devon Convergence. So this poster behind me is from that first event. So these are one-day events that we hold once a year. And the idea is to create uh, a network of people who are doing things like what we're doing here in other places of Dev uh, other parts of Devon and to create the conditions for some of the innovations that are working to spread. So one of the problems in the movement for positive change is everybody thinks they have to do their own thing. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel all the time and make the same mistakes that somebody else has made. There are a lot of great projects out there that could work in other places. So if any of the things I've just talked about could work in other places, well, they should be doing those in other places. And we should be doing other things, too, if they're working in other places. So 
So we're quite open to that. And this, this event that we do every year has been a really great way to, to begin building that kind of movement here. In fact, in fact, one of the things I should mention is the new Bank of the Southwest. So the banking sector, the banking industry in Britain is, is pretty much a monoculture and it's pretty much dominated by national and international banks which means that after the crash uh, many of these banks did not uh, continue to lend to small and medium-sized enterprises so many enterprises that could have expanded and hired more people um, especially the, the, the green and social ones that we like weren't able to get access to the finance so so this gap has been in part filled by our local entrepreneur forum and some of that activity but we still need more banks we still need more banks that are that are focused on the needs of local people and local economies so um, there's a new bank starting up called the bank of the southwest and it's part of a, it's a cooperative bank and uh, it's part of a network of regional cooperative banks that's starting up all over the country and um, the guy who's starting this bank up kind of launched the idea at one of these Devon Convergence events. So we're, we're, we're pretty, we're, you know, we're pretty closely linked to that project now. Um, we're one of the founding members of, um, of the bank. Hopefully it'll start, um, it'll open and start its banking services sometime late next year. But it's kind of an exciting development, and that kind of thing, I think, will have a massive impact on our local economy. The important thing that I've learned, anyway, is that the basis for change, for creating change, is about relationships. And it's about, um, it's about interpersonal relationships. So, you know, having conversations with people, especially conversations with people you don't ordinarily talk to, but also bringing people together in spaces where collectively, whether it's a group of 10 or a group of 100, collectively people can, can discuss ideas and issues, exchange ideas, and maybe even commit to exchanging resources, um, creating conditions for collaborations and so on. So it was in that context, when Tony came to, to this meeting, we had about 80 or 90 people in the room, he made the presentation and he, he, this is what he told me, he said he walked away later thinking, it could actually work, I'm going to do it. And I think, I think the, the reason is because he saw that there were these collectives out there, however loosely organized, that there were groups of people coming together that would support the, 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 new, the new models, the new enterprises, entities, the new banks, whatever. So I think I think these little things, at the end of the day, these little things are really, really important. Okay. So this is a 21 pound tautness, 21 tautness pound note. Um, the idea came about, I think, probably close to 10 years ago now. And the idea was, hey, if we had our own money, this could be a way to support our local independent enterprises. And not only that, it could help to shift people's ideas about uh, economics. Um, who makes money? Where does money come from? And maybe even help to give us a bit of a sense of local identity. So um, they started out by just kind of printing out some bills. Well, you can't do that. It's not legal. <laughs> so. The second round, um, they got permission to print these things, and the actual model is that they're backed by the pound. So in order to get one tautness pound, you have to give over one pound sterling. So it's not money per se. Technically speaking, it's more like a coupon or a voucher. So they're, they're supposed to expire, and you can trade it back for a pound. So the, the next couple of rounds they printed one pound notes some members of the you know some um, some of the local businesses decided to accept them I think they had a hundred or, or 150 businesses accept them 
uh, and they had some funding to, to create a big launch and marketing. So when you have the big launch and the big marketing effort, uh, people kind of wake up and they say, oh, what's this? Oh, it's a new pound. Maybe I'll give it a try. Da, da, da. Um, then they got more funding to launch this next round where they've done one pound, five pound, 10 pound, and 21 pound notes. They're beautiful, as you can see. They're printed by the same company that prints the pound sterling. So they have little security uh, bits in there. They had some, some funds to do marketing and outreach. And it, again, they experienced this kind of flowering of interest. One of the things that we've noticed is that it doesn't circulate. So the businesses accept the pound, they stack up, they go and they turn them back in for pound sterling. So if they don't circulate, it doesn't really do a good job of supporting the local traders. It doesn't do a good job of keeping the money local. So unfortunately, a lot of people who, who uh, promote the Totnes pound model or the Bristol pound model, um, they make this claim that it helps to keep the money local, but that's very debatable. I'm already supporting local traders, so I'm not going to use it. Um, I'm already giving them my pound sterling. And anyway, if it was circulating, and I would use it, but it doesn't circulate. So does it do a good job keeping money in, in the local economy? This particular model, no. Um, does it do a good job of, of uh, raising people's awareness? Well, in the beginning, when there's money to promote it, yes. By and large, the people who, who become convinced that it's a good idea to support local businesses, they just start doing it because they've, they've made a decision based on their own values, not because of a gimmick. Um, these days, mostly it's tourists who come and they say, oh, we want to see your money and how does it work? And, um, does it create a sense of local identity? Maybe. So for my money, so to speak, uh, as, you know, um, as an economist, I guess, and I would say, well, what's the opportunity cost? So if there's a lot of money being invested in this particular model of local currency, and it's not doing all the things that you'd like it to do, well, then it's the, not the right model. So what are some other things? If you want to keep the money lo circulating locally, what are some other things that you could do? Well, in the United States, there's a really good model. Um, there's a network of independent traders and a network of networks. Um, they all promote shopping local or thinking local first. And that works really well because then people change their behavior based on values, not because of a gimmick. So a lot of people have said, well, what about Bristol? Because Bristol has this similar model and it works. Well, it only works in Bristol because they have money behind them. They have a staff of like 10 people who are promoting it all the time. If you take away that promotion, it doesn't work. Now, this isn't to say that there isn't a role for complementary currencies. There absolutely is, but there are other models that, that can be used. So there are social currencies, um, as they're called in Spain, for example, social currencies, where uh, people are extending credit to one another. So it's a mutual credit system. And I think these do a very good job of filling some of the, some of the gaps and um, creating some liquidity for people um, outside of that, that monocultural national uh, currency system. There are more robust mutual credit systems that are serving businesses. For example, there's a very famous example of the beer in Switzerland. Uh, there are other examples. There's the Sardex in Sardinia. That's part of uh, a network of similar uh, business to business, business to business mutual credit systems that are that is uh, working in other parts of Europe, um, and then there are there are other models that um, I've heard about um, where uh, currencies are backed, complementary community currencies are backed by volunteer labor or um, compostable waste or other kinds of things, so. You know, I think I think the 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 arena of 
possible solutions um, that could be put forward by or supported by different currency models is an interesting area, but there are a lot, many different models and they all serve a different purpose. This particular one, I think, has um, you know has had its day, so to speak. Really? We have Triados Bank, and um, there might be some other ones. There are some there are some credit unions in the north, especially. There are a couple of credit unions down here, but they're not very robust. Credit unions don't also um, very often offer the same services as banks, so it's not really the same kind of thing. The banking industry here is, um, as, as I said before, it's very monocultural. So there, it's dominated by some big national and international banks, and there's not much else. This is why it's so exciting that the Bank of the Southwest is starting up. Uh, that project is, is ongoing. Um, it's a very interesting model, and you can learn more about them. It's, the, it's called the, well, it's a franchise model. So the website uh, to learn more about the franchise is, it's called, uh, what is it called? I think it's called Community Savings Bank Association. I think that's it, Community Savings Bank Association. So CSB org or .org UK, something like that. Um, and they will support, I think, 12 or 15 regional banks across the country. And because it's a franchise, they've, they've done a lot of the, the hard work um, in terms of regulations and, and stuff like that. So it'll make it easier for these franchisees, uh, of which the Bank of the Southwest will be one, to get started. So they need about 20 million pounds to become fully capitalized. Um, so what's needed? Well, all that stuff is in March, but what's needed are investors to get it going, and then they have to pass some, some more regulatory steps, and then they will begin to open some branches and, and start working. In terms of the work that we're trying to do, I'm, I'm very optimistic, and I feel, I feel very positive. Um, so the stuff, the projects that, that, that we're engaged with here, are working and um, we are interested now in working with other groups across the UK and across Europe who might want to pick up these models and, and replicate these kinds of projects in, in their uh, communities or their towns or cities or, or regions. We're also interested in seeing what we can learn from other places to bring new models here that would complement what we're already doing as well. So um, uh, I think for the next several years this is, this is what we'll be doing. We'll be developing our regional network but also looking at other projects from further afield and trying to, to build those connections. So I think, I think uh, the thing that will contribute most to change is, is building these networks and being, being open-minded and curious about what other people are doing. So there's that kind of principle of subsidiarity. We're, you know, we're a small little piece of the puzzle, um, but by being connected with other people, we can, we can become a bigger, more, um, you know, more potent, force for change. And so I think those kinds of things are happening. So I'm, I'm very optimistic. One of the, one of the things that, that people are beginning to wake up to, especially people who would identify themselves as being progressives or on the left or part of a movement for positive change, whatever you want to call it, I think the dawning awareness is that we're not a strong enough movement yet. And I think one of the reasons is that the many different strands of the movement are not very well connected. So, um, you know, after, after 40 years of 
what you might call neoliberal capitalism, the globalization of uh, corporate economics, which has left many in the developed world um, feeling resentment. This, you know, this is this is part of the explanation for why far right parties are gaining strength in Europe. Um, it's part of the reason why so many people voted for Brexit. It's part of the reason why Trump was elected in the United States. So I think a lot of a lot of people working for positive change on the left, they they neglected what was happening in some of these deindustrialized cities and those workers. Um, so that's a big thing. After the crash of 2008, the crash of 2008 supposedly discredited capitalism. Um, in Britain, we've had 10 years of austerity. And, uh, and yet, where's the opposition? We're deeper in. We're, we're, we're as deeply into that same model as we've ever been. So I think the dawning awareness for people who are working for positive change is that whatever it is we're doing, we have to be open-minded and self-critical and say, okay, well, is what we're doing working? <laughs> if it isn't, we need to change and do something else. If it is working and it just needs to be bigger, great. Um, but whatever, we need to get more connected. So um, you asked me if, if what we're doing and, and you know, what other people are doing is helping to, to build resilience. Uh, and I would say yes. I think that's happening in pockets. Uh, so in pockets across Europe, there are places where I think um, there have been, there's been an increase in, in resilience in the local economic uh, picture. More people are finding ways of making their livings while consuming less and, and disconnecting or, or decoupling, becoming less dependent upon the global economic system. Obviously you have the, the Obviously, you have the, the example in Spain of Marina Leda, which uh, is a big inspiration for, for many people over here and what's happening now in Barcelona. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I think it's happening in pockets. But again, this is where I think, for me personally, I'm, I'm optimistic and seeing hope is that, is that the connections are beginning to be made. So in Britain, you have, you have lots and lots of people now who are quite aware of what's happening in, in Barcelona and other places or across Spain because of the Indignados movement, because of Podemos to a large degree. But not only, because I know, whatever, Podemos is not the whole solution. It might be part of the solution, but it's not the whole solution. And the same thing here. Everybody's excited about Corbyn, but I think there's also the awareness that he's not the solution he might be part of the solution, but he's not the solution. The, the challenges we face are huge. Uh, they're bigger than party politics. What we need more than anything is for people to rise as citizens with their dignity and with the expectation of liberty and to be able to act to, to um, ensure that we're gonna we're gonna be up for these challenges because if we don't rise up and act, if we sit on the couch watching TV, or you know surfing the internet, we're gonna be doomed. But it's happening, it's happening, so that gives me great hope. Really? So some examples of, of uh, where some of this some of these movements are beginning to connect with each other, some of the the, the different strands. Um, in April of last year, in Malaga, there was the New Economy and Social Innovation Forum. So that brought together many different actors in this very, very broad, I don't even want to say it's a movement yet, but a very broad field of new economic activity. It's not quite a movement yet, but that event, uh, there were six or eight hundred people who were there, myself included, and uh, it did a very nice job of getting different disparate actors talking to one another. Um, I'm part of organizing something in Britain coming up next month in March called Control Shift Emergency Summit for Change where we're going to do something similar trying to bring together the disparate and, and diverse actors um, people working for new politics, people working for new economics, people working on the environment, people working for 
land issues and so on, bring them all together into a room and get them to start talking. There's the Democracy Collaborative and the Next System Project in the United States. They're working on some models that are working over there. They're coming over here and some, of, some, you know, some uh, cross-pollinization is happening. So um, those are three examples. And the, within the transition world, there's a transition uh, network where the, the various um, national hubs across Europe are connecting and collaborating on various projects. So there's a project um, led by the, the Spanish transition hub to connect municipalities with um, uh, transition groups that are happening. Uh, the new municipalist movement, that is, uh, I suppose, that the emblem for it, the icon for it, is what's happening in Barcelona. It's happening in other places too, but Barcelona is, is playing a leading role in connecting with other places to, to, to try to, to spread the models that are working there. There's the degrowth movement um, that has been looking to create heterogeneous networks uh, of people who are taking action on the ground. There's, there are many examples of things that are happening and, you know, um, I think on the agenda for everyone involved in all of this work is, yes, we need to connect with people who are not like us and doing other things that are related and we need to connect more. So I think this, this is just really the start of something and it's pretty exciting because I think, you know, um, change is happening. Will it be enough on time? That I don't know. But you know, one of the things that gives me hope is that all of this stuff, the, the global economy, the political systems, human society, it's a complex adaptive system, just like evolution, just like ecosystems. It's a complex adaptive system. So who knows? Who really knows what effects are going to come from this activity or that activity? It may be, it may be a very small thing that happens in Cartadeo that leads to a big blossoming of positive change that we can't predict. So we must just continue to do things that we think are going to work. Every step forward we take creates a new horizon of possibility, creates more, uh, more adjacent possibilities for change. So if we just keep moving, if we can just keep um, trying things and doing things and connecting in an open-minded, open-hearted kind of way, we can't, we can't help but, but move forward in ways that will give us the best chance of being on time. Hello?